St. Francis of Assisi is one of the most beloved saints in history, but how well do we really know him? And what can we learn from him about our own journey to God? Join us today as we explore those questions and more with Father Dave Pavanka, TOR, producer and host of a new documentary, St. Francis of Assisi, Sign of Contradiction. I'm Dr. Bob Rice, professor of catechetics at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Rice, a professor of catechetics here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we're talking about St. Francis' sign of contradiction. I'm joined by our guest panelist, Dr. William Newton, a theology professor here at Franciscan University, and regular panelist, Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, Father Dave Pavanka, who is the president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. A popular speaker and author, Father Pavanka's books include Breath of God and Hiking the Camino 500 Miles with Jesus. He is also the producer and host of a video series on the Holy Spirit called The Wild Goose. And we're here today to discuss his new documentary, St. Francis of Assisi, Sign of Contradiction. Father Dave, welcome to our show. It's great Thank to have you. you here. It's really a pleasure to be here. I like being a special guest. That's you are nice. a special yeah, guest. That's great. Yeah, that's great. We great. don't say that about everybody. I can imagine you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, tell us about uh, the genesis of making this documentary on the life of St. Francis. Oh, that's great. Well, I mean, that's actually a really big story. Um, I would say in one sense, it, it might have started the day our Holy Father was elected. Hmm. When he comes to the, you know, to the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square, and he takes the name Francis. And I begin to think, why? I mean, nobody's ever taken the name Francis. Isn't that well. interesting that yeah. nobody's ever yeah. done and it's that like, before? Why? Right? why? So I begin to kind of ask the question, why now? Maybe, you know, I think Francis has always had something to say to our culture and to our world, but why now? So just kind of sitting and praying with that. And then just a number of experiences and in, in kind of discovering more about Francis personally in my own spiritual life and where we find ourselves in, in our culture, in our times. Um, and then there was kind of this situation that happened for me. I was actually in Assisi. And I was talking to a waiter there, and he was talking about what he loved about St. Francis. And he went through this big list of, I love this, and I love the fact that he loved animals, and nature, and all these things, all beautiful and true. And then he, he closed by saying, oh, but, but the whole Jesus thing, I'm, I'm just not into Jesus. Jesus, the, the church, I just, I don't have any time for that. <laughs> yeah, so I, well, but what that really struck me is that there's a population that maybe thinks they know who Francis is, yeah. and he's so much more than that. I mean, I've... I've been to Assisi dozens of times. And so oftentimes people will say to me, there's so much more to St. Francis than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of wrestled with that and prayed through that. And they said, okay, let's, let's try to present Francis in a way that might help people have a deeper understanding of who he is. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, the line is, Francis is more than a bird bath, right? right? Yeah. So we've all got a bird bath of Francis, and there has to be something more than that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it seems to me the DVD really did that because I was thinking, um, Okay, more than the bird bath, more than animal lover, but actually even things like more than simply a lover of poverty. Yeah, absolutely. So there's things in there you think, well, it really struck me because I was thinking, well, you know, he's married to poverty. We have this phrase, but the DVD kind of seems to say something more than that. He's married to poverty because he's married to the poor one. He's married to Jesus. Absolutely. He's married to poverty in the same way that Bob's wife's married to poverty. By marrying a poor man, yeah. you marry <laughs> poverty, yeah? Yeah. yeah? And and in that sense, it's it really f takes your attention away from these sort of peripheral, maybe important things, but really he is the lover of yeah. Jesus. To, to hear you say that says to me that we got it, right? Because that's exactly what our desire was. If, if we don't know what animated the life of Francis, we really don't understand Francis. And, and to say that one could understand Francis without having a deeper understanding, deeper encounter with the Lord, is, is just simply inconsistent. So that's great to hear you say that. What about, one of the things that really jumped out to me in the storyline as your documentary unfolds his life was his early years. I mean, of course, I knew, you know, about standing in front of his father and the bishop, but um, I was very fascinated by a lot of the backstory, yeah. who St. Francis was uh, before he became the man that mm -hmm. we know him to, to be today. 
Well, uh, my desire is to, and, and it's often the case, in fact, I remember years and years ago, and I'm going to say this and I hope that it's true, but I heard Mother Angelica had a quote one time, and that was, that uh, people who write the stories of saints are going to spend extra time in purgatory. And she went on to it by saying is that we often make them so other than what they really were. Mm. So our desire was to try to create a film that, that presented Francis as a real person. You know, not this idea or not this collage of, of all these. And so Francis's early life was a story of struggle. It was a story of searching. I mean, Francis wanted to be popular. He wanted to be influential. He wanted to be wealthy. He wanted esteem and, and all of these things. So it's him wrestling and struggling with this. You know, his desire was to be a knight and going off and coming back in great honor, uh, having been in battle, and he gets captured. Yeah, and, and for this, a year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And this throws a wrench into it. And it's really in that time that he begins to the Lord is kind of encountering him and saying, Francis, maybe there's something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I watched it, I was thinking, I don't know why it never occurred to me before that Francis was a cradle Catholic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so he's really a paradigm of ongoing conversion. Absolutely. That it wasn't just the conversion experience that I had as a teenager, only he had a little year, you know, after a year of imprisonment and that sort of thing when he comes back and begins to reassess things. And, and likewise, when you see the movie, you begin to realize that it wasn't just when he departs from the town or he breaks from his father and he walks away naked and right, right. makes those statements. It's something that is so profoundly ongoing. Absolutely. We use the word metanoia in the film, that, that idea of constant conversion day after day after day. And that's exactly, again, that's great because that's one of the things we want to get yeah. across is we, we have this idea, I think, of, uh, of conversion as an event of the past. And, and I think Francis's life shows us that conversion is a process. It's, it's yesterday, it's today, it's tomorrow. It's this continued journey that we're on. I, I would also say that, you know, Francis, the birdbath, the naturalist, you know, the animal lover and all of that, I also have found over the years that Franciscans sometimes reduce Francis's own life process to a kind of dawning social consciousness mm -hmm. and that they're looking at it in terms of their own historical consciousness. You know, I was in Vietnam and then I came to reassess my life and, to, and that's good, but I mean, it's the encounter with Jesus Christ absolutely, absolutely. that is absolutely decisive. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. There's also something striking in that, uh, as you, I noticed in the film, you correct yourself at one moment, you say he's not a knight and then he is a knight. And it makes an important point, doesn't it? That there, it, this, this thing of, um, there are things in his unconverted state which kind of propel him or the Lord can use to bring him to a moment of crisis then a moment of conversion. I mean, he's very generous as an unconverted man. I mean, he's generous with other people's things. Right, right. Yeah. Much he, easier to do. Yeah, he, right. he wants to serve and therefore the Lord can say to him who is the better one to serve. So it's this thing of sort of grace builds on nature. There is something in him naturally, which allows him to be a kind of chosen one or elected one. But again, I suppose there's also a discontinuity. There's things that when but the Holy Spirit sure, breaks sure in, something utterly new comes. But I think that speaks to one of the, the point about conversion. I think that some people have an anxiety about conversion as if I'm going to have this conversion, I'm, the Lord is going to totally transform me. In one sense, He is. He's going to totally transform our heart, but He's also going to use our gifts and our passions and our talents that, that are of Him to bring forth greater fruit. And you see that in Francis's life. But the way that William just said it raises the question, was he really in an unconverted state? He was in a, in a process of conversion. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. always in a process yeah, of conversion, yeah. but I, I, I began to realize he wasn't unconverted. He was not simply baptized, but I suspect that for many of his years, he kind of thought of himself as a Catholic Christian. Mm -hmm. And a decent one, not a great one and all of that. I mean, there's no written, there's no written record of, of the way he saw himself spiritually before that breakthrough. Okay. Yeah. But I had a sense that he would not have described himself at the time as unconverted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite, quite possibly. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many of us would have seen ourselves, quote unquote, before, right? right? Before right, that right. breakthrough, exactly, before exactly, that encounter yeah, yeah. with Christ. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just think that most children who grow up in a family don't appreciate their family until they leave and then they come back. But it isn't because they're not a part of the family. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's, a, there's a breakthrough, there's a maturing, that sort of thing. Sure. That's One cool. of the insights I found really moving mm -hmm. in the documentary, you know, I'd always heard that Francis would say statements like, I'm the greatest sinner of all. Right. And would look back at his life and say, oh, I'm the greatest sinner of all. Well, in a contemporary mindset, you hear that and you think, wow, he must have been out like hanging with girls, getting drunk, you know, part, you know, doing all these things. And 
in many ways, his life was somewhat tame, at least morally speaking, by, by today's standards. And yet, as you looked deeper into his spirituality and his language, the idea that it wasn't, it wasn't about some uh, horrible moral act that occurred, which mm-hmm. is what we often think of when someone says it's a great sinner, but it's, mm-hmm. it's that idea of missing the mark. It's that the Lord was calling him and he was saying no to it. And that really seemed to be at the heart of his reflection of, you know, it, it was about, you know, just not accepting God's call or responding to God's call. No, and I think that becomes the impetus in, in much of his conversion in that being aware of his, his sinfulness, Francis would kind of, the sin is just pushing God to the side, mm-hmm. but becoming more aware of it in a, in a deeply profound sense and personal sense, everything, uh, about Francis, I think he understood the personal nature of his relationship with, with Christ and with the Father, and, and sin offended this. But deeper than that, and this is really part of the significant event, right, in his conversion, is that moment that he realizes the Lord loves him still. Mm-hmm. He loves him still in the midst of his brokenness, in the midst of his sinfulness. And, and this is really our desire for the film, was that this is all of our story. You know, there's a sense, I think, sometimes that, that when we get holy, whatever that means or whatever that looks like, that we are no longer going to sin. But, but Francis discovers as, as he grows in this journey of faith and journey of, of conversion to the Lord that, that that is a consistent companion. You know, he's never totally over it. The closer we get to the light, the more we see. And God's love is always deeper still. Mm-hmm. God's mercy is always still. But there are sort of, um, though it's a gradual process, there's clearly sort of, as it were, sort of event horizons in his life where God breaks in. And it seems the initial one is, is a kind of crisis. When I was watching, I was actually thinking of my brother-in-law who was a, he was a great athlete um, as, a, as a young man and he was on target to actually run for England uh, in the Sydney Olympics. Mm-hmm. And in the trials, uh, he uh, broke his Achilles tendon. Oh he was tripped and mm-hmm. broke it and that totally ruined his career. He, had, he was a man of perseverance, of training and discipline. He became a priest. Hmm. That, that totally changed yeah, yeah, yeah. it, like a crisis moment where he was on a trajectory, had certain inbuilt things which the Lord could use, but God had to break in yeah. to elect somebody. Yeah. It's an election to be a priest. It's not a sort of normal trajectory. Right, right, right. And it seems that there is a gradualness, but the Lord is decisively touching at moments. Yeah, there are clearly markers that, that one can look at in, in experiences and encounters that he had that were transformative for him. Mm-hmm. You know, I think of the, the rich young ruler uh, because here is Francis, he's young, he's seeking riches, he's seeking power, but he's also, for the most part, I suspect, keeping the commandments. Mm-hmm. These have I done since my youth. Well, there's one thing you lack, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that there's a sense of discovery for me, like, you know, his role model in a certain sense. I mean, this would have been unconscious or unspoken. I want to be someone who keeps the commandments of God a rich young ruler, you know? yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, Christ is not encountering somebody who is strictly unconverted. He loves him, he has compassion on him, but he's calling him to a, a crisis, as it were, you know, without breaking his Achilles tendon. He's basically breaking through and he goes away sad, you know? And I, I, I always wondered, did he ever come back? Did he yeah, ever yeah, read yeah, the gospel and say, there's still time, you know? Yeah. Uh, because that kind of grace returns to people if, in fact, they, they turn their back. Not always, but right, right, right. I think that mercy abides. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that Francis' response when he heard the Gospel of Matthew reading was, was one of joy. You know, the rich young ruler went away sad. And, you know, even though he made that decision for riches, mm-hmm. uh, and many times we do this as well, he walked away knowing he was missing something, but Francis is, you know, one of that major moments of Francis's conversion. It wasn't because he was felt guilty or he felt no. pressure in any right. way. It was a, it was a, it was a joy. It was a yeah. freedom. A you know, profound that he was thrilled. For him, right? Yeah. Right. This is what I've been looking for. Yeah, and there's something about that. So he hears the gospel in, in from the text of Matthew, and it resonates in his heart. There's something about that. He says, "This is what I've been looking for." And it's really the beginning of the, of the film, the, the beginning section is this sense of Francis is searching. Something is going to satisfy this, this longing. And, and he becomes more aware that there's a void there that the Lord is ultimately going to be able to fill. Keeping commandments is great, but it's not enough, you know. Right. And so the ruler goes away sad because he just can't imagine giving things up. That he, right. On the other hand, you know, Francis discovers joy because he's not thinking about what he's giving up. 
He's thinking about what he's getting right. instead, right. you know, right. and all the difference in the world. And that's such an important message for the new evangelization, you right. know, is that we don't uh, show Catholicism about all the things that you can't do anymore, but holiness is a yes mm -hmm. and not a no. And certainly we see that in the life of St. Francis. And as we continue on this conversation, uh, we will be continuing to examine uh, this amazing and wonderful life. So please stay with us. I'm part of a household at Franciscan University called Illuminata Pace, and we are focused on the writings of St. Francis and St. Clair. And our charisms are peace, prayerfulness, joy, and humility. And those charisms are really important in today's world because they really allow us in this place of kind of anxiety and stress that we really feel to be really centered on God and the way that He can make us really have just kind of a centeredness that we can't really find in the world that we have today. When God created you, He made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His Church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about St. Francis, Sign of Contradiction with Father Dave Pavanka. So we talked a bit about his early life and then uh, the documentary did a, a, a real beautiful examination of that moment where he uh, you know, turned away from his earthly father and toward his heavenly father. And I thought the film did a great job of showing that his earthly father really cared for him. Like even though, um, you know, some of the actions seemed harsh, I mean, he was just trying to raise him sure, as, sure. as the world would have, and yet the Lord had a different plan for him. Sure, and I think the way you put the question, Bob, was really important, and that is, uh, as the world would have, that, that he wanted in one respect all the things that, I mean, that are good, I guess. There's nothing wrong with wealth and, and all the, nothing wrong with any of that. I mean, that. as a father, I think, gosh, I'd like my kids to be successful yeah, yeah. and get a good so job. They can and retire and <laughs> exactly. live off them. I see right. how this yeah, is pretty going. Much. <laughs> I'm a parasite. There I'm okay go. with that. But um, no, so that's, I, I think in some ways, Francis's dad does get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. but, but clearly there does become, at one time, a breach in their relationship. And we don't know kind of how that settled and whatnot, but he wanted, yeah, he wanted his best for his son, as any father would. Um, but they were never able to quite reconcile when the Lord begins to move in Francis's life and inviting to something else. His father was not quite able to understand that. But even to that end, I think it's, it's been one of the things that people have written to me and it's resonated with them, and that is um, one can come from a not perfect family and still be a saint. And I think the, one of our desires of the film is, is to help us understand that this call to sanctity is for each one of us. And a broken family or a difficult family situation doesn't preclude us from being able to be holy and being a saint. So it was actually one of the things that people have kind of grabbed onto, it's mm -hmm. resonated in them that I think has been moving. I think Sister Olga's, mm -hmm. that whole scene yes. with Sister Olga is just so beautiful in that film about her relationship with her dad and not supporting her vocation was really, was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another event, of course, is the meeting uh, with the leper. And actually, I have to say that the presentation of that was the thing that struck me the most, just per, just personally. I was thinking, sign of contradiction, and it's very easy to take that title and think, yeah, Francis is a sign of contradiction to the world, and I stand with Francis, you know, I'm with his contradiction of the world. But I was asked the question, how's he contradicting me? Mm -hmm. How's he challenging me? Mm -hmm. And it was with the meeting of the leper, because he somehow seemed to sort of be able to break through the double glazing that at least I have, and I think a lot of people have put in their life against the poor 
against right. Paul, which are a threatening right. reality right. to us. Um, he seems to have this idea of what you might call sacramentality of the poor, that not that what they do is what Christ does, but what we do to them, we, we do to Christ. And I, I just haven't been able to break through that right, right. double glazing. And what really struck me was the leper not only was repulsive in a certain way to him, it was threatening, was dangerous. Sure. You can catch something. Sure. Sure. And I was thinking, well, that, I mean, that's just the sort of attitude I could have towards the modern poor, like immigrants. Right. Yeah. If we let them in, that, that's dangerous. Right, right, right. Not only I don't like the fact they're poor or that's challenging me at just the level of money, right. there's danger involved. And yet he was able to overcome that only because he saw Christ in the poor, and I haven't seen that. Right, right, right. It really, that's the sign of contradiction right, right, to me right, in that right. movie. Right. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is maybe like a, a step too far, but when he comes to the leper and he sees Christ and overcomes his natural abhorrence, it, it seems to me that we, 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 we idealize this idea of finding Christ in the poorest of the poor or in the leper, when in fact what Christ is really doing is identifying himself not just with them, but with us. And in the process, he's not just revealing himself to us through them, He's revealing us to ourselves. I've entered into solidarity with sinners, a leper, and not just to show you how you ought to have compassion in a kind of socially conscious way, but who you are. Right, right. And there's something liberating. Even if I'm overstepping or overinterpreting, you know, my own takeaway from that was there's something liberating in recognizing that I'm a leper, but I only discovered it by Christ entering into that radical identification right, with sinners. Right. And I abhor the leper, but I also abhor myself, but I don't usually let myself know that. Right. But Christ allows me to recognize just how ugly I not just can be, but I am. You know, even when I'm good on the surface, yeah. there's something more. And I, I just thought, man, that is not only a moment of conversion, but it becomes that moment of ongoing conversion because it isn't like the next morning he re you know, looked in the mirror and said, you know, Boy, now that I embrace the leper, I'm no longer one. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that the part of Francis is before he embraces that leper is just that is him kind of wrestling with the mess that is his life. Right. And and then the, the account after that of embracing that leper. I think that's. I think uh, first off, I'm not going to correct you if you're wrong because <laughs> far be it from me. I mean, I think that's your story, and I think that's exactly what the Lord uh, is saying to you to it. And I think it's beautiful, and I think it's true. I think it's true. You know, going back, rewind for a minute, because, you know, uh, he was the oldest son. And so in that natural order, which is not just, you know, pre-Christian ancient Judaism, you know, the Catholic Church teaches that the family is an ecclesia domestica. It's a, do a domestic church. And so though the father could be absentee, being in France, doing commerce and all of that, a big part of that was to raise his family to provide for them and to take the firstborn and to hand it off to him, like any responsible sure, father sure, should sure. do. You know, granted, there is a kind of blindness or a, 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 you know, he's not open at all to this supernatural vocation that is given to his son. And so there is a broken relationship and a real new revelation of fatherhood. But I, I, I just came away with a lot of surprising <laughs> insights, yeah, like, yeah. you know, you gotta go back and revisit this. And I've probably revisited it at least a dozen times mm -hmm but not quite this much, not this, you know, clear. Yeah, I think the the, the whole encounter and, and all, I think all that you said is really beautiful that I love Luke 4 when Jesus says, you know, he's coming to heal the blind and it's easy for us to say, that's great that Jesus healed those people that are blind, but that's my story, that's me, right? That's right. I'm the one and when, when embra he embraces a leper, he finds even in himself with that. But I think one of the, I think I agree, it's one of the most moving scenes. We do some of the scenes in Brazil with, the Franciscan, secular Franciscan who embraces the leper. And just those images are beautiful in, in how Sister speaks of us being able to reconcile who is that leper in our own world. Mm -hmm. and, and this transformation and this conversion that takes place. And yet I think it, it helps us understand. People will say, you know, what is it about Francis? His joy, his peace, all these. So before Francis has this encounter, he hears the Lord say, I can make that which is bittersweet. And, and, I, and I just found myself since during the film, the film was a conversion for me, just in really understanding more Francis and myself and my relationship with Francis and the Lord. But imagine for a moment nothing bitter in your life. You know, for, for Francis, it was the leper. It was, it was bitterness. It was revolting. It was, and yet 
I believe in a God who really can make that which is bitter and make that sweet. And that's what Francis is experiencing in his life. And, and I think it's at the heart and the deeper understanding of Francis and his joy in that is that as the Lord begins to transform whatever is bitter, you know, it could be a relationship with a family member, it could be our past, it could be whatever it is, the Lord really can take that and make that sweet. And, and if we begin to live a life of less bitterness, right, we're experiencing greater sweet. And I think it's really one of the insights and the you know, just the beautiful points of the life of mm -hmm. St. Francis. The movie obviously can't go over all the aspects of St. Francis's life. I'm just curious yeah. about his wife and his, uh, not his wife, <laughs> his poverty. Yeah, we, his chose, poverty. we chose not to talk <laughs> about that. Yeah, good, We're yeah, all the curious. Dark, the, dark, yeah. the dark side of things. Uh, no, but his mom, his siblings, um, how did the rest of the family you know, we hear so much about the dad and his role. What about? We really don't know. And right. I'm not a scholar, but we really don't know a lot about the rest of his family in the situation. Obviously, his mother was more inclined to support what was going on in Francis's life and the transformation conversion that's taking place. But other than that, I don't know. It's not to say that others or other things that I've read, I've just not read much about the rest of the family members. But situations. He, he lost his natural family, but he picked up another family. Sure. And in a sense, actually, that doesn't have a particular um, central point in the film. I just wonder about that. I mean, Claire, for example, does Claire, St. Claire come in or, right. or his brothers? Um, I mean, to what degree you can have a little bit, or I have a little bit of impression of St. Francis being a bit of a lone ranger. I mean, others come up yeah, yeah. behind him and yeah. next to him and they want to be with him, but he's a bit of a lone ranger. Or is he really a community man? Well, I think he's very much a community man. Yeah. I mean, I think Francis could have been a lone ranger in that I don't think he was even by his own brothers. I don't think he was fully understood. Mm -hmm. um, so in that perspective, maybe. But he really saw the brothers and the Lord bringing him his brothers as a response to his prayer. The Lord gave me the gift of brothers. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that 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 was really key to him. And it was also, in anybody who's, we all know this, right, because we're all in a relationship, it also became part of his difficulty and his struggle, was that as, as the vision began to be passed on to other friars and then beginning to adopt that, that maybe not what Francis had originally thought, and then this becomes a source of, of suffering for Francis. Mm -hmm. But it, it gets to the point of, uh, I, I'm often asked why we didn't deal with this, this, and this, and th there's just so many different aspects and right. in, in, in facets mm -hmm. uh, of, of his life that we just kind of had to settle on, on a few areas, and really, as much as anything, his, his broad process and journey of conversion. Mm -hmm. right. Facets, I think, is a good term. It reminds you of a gem, you That's know, and you, 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 can't, you can't get it all with one perspective or even with one glance. You know, uh, it reminds me too that, you know, you can fixate on certain facets and kind of distort things by neglecting, but I'm not saying that the movie does that, but it reminded me of things like waiting upon Innocent the mm Third. -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. this man's a Catholic. Francis believed in the Pope. And, right, right. you know, even though Innocent the Third is not canonized in approving Dominic and Francis, sure. calling for the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, I mean, the Fourth Lateran Council was for the Middle Ages what the Council of Nicaea was in the patristic period. It's often referred to as the council, you know, seven sacraments, transubstantiation, analogy, all of these things. But, you know, the renewal that Innocent III brings about is almost impossible apart without Fran sure, apart sure. from Francis and Dominic. No, and one of the things we talk about is that, that he was, a, to say, a thoroughly Catholic man. And, yeah. and we can't lose sight of that. that that Francis, I mean, he was going to be obedient to the church, so he submitted his rule to the church, and he waited for the church. And he, now, that's not to say that he didn't continue to prod her and and, and invite discussion. And, and I mean, I think that the Lord had placed something on his heart, and he wanted to be faithful to that. Mm -hmm. But Francis wasn't going to go off and do it on his own. No, that, that he wanted the blessing of the of the church, and and mm -hmm. and I think the image of Francis when he sells everything and goes to the bishop in this encounter he has with the bishop and his father. I love the image of the bishop taking him under his cloak, mm -hmm. right? And, and that we are going to now protect you, we're gonna walk with you. I mean, it's it's the image of the Portsiancola. You've got the little, little small Portsiancola church and the massive, huge church protecting her. I think that's what the church does for Francis mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, it would be great if historically that the, the, the Franciscans, we never kind of veered away, and we did veer away every now and then, right? But the prayers is that we continue to submit ourselves to the church and see the wisdom, the protection, the guidance, and the support, and the transformation, continued transformation of the community through that. So, and he, Why is he so popular? In, in that sense, you know, he's a man of the church and the church is not popular. Right. He's a sign of contradiction. And yet he's probably the most popular Catholic saint outside of the church. Yeah. 
How, how do we reconcile that? I mean, that's the question that, that we, we always say. What is it about Francis? At the very beginning, the opening scene is, what is it about Francis? Is it his joy? Some people, yes. It is his peace. Is it his surrender? Is it the... Uh, it speaks to everybody. There's something about him that really speaks to a population that really is not interested in, in all of the other things that go along with the life of Francis. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Well, we're going to keep looking at the life of St. Francis as we continue at Franciscan University Presents. So stay with us. Francis is such a popular saint today not only because he's such a good model for just the Franciscans, but arguably for all Catholics. His devotion to the Blessed Mother and the Eucharist is so essential to all of Catholicism. We need to have constant recourse to Our Lady and the Eucharist so that way they can lead us deeper into God's love. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, You'll be prepared for real-world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we're coming to you from the Communication Arts Studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment and my colleagues, Dr. William Newton and Dr. Scott Hahn are guiding our discussion on St. Francis, Sign of Contradiction with Father Dave Pavanka. Um, you gave me an insight uh, in a very famous story of St. Francis of Assisi when he's before the San Damiano cross mm -hmm. and he hears the message, rebuild my church. And you even mentioned it. I'd always heard that Bonaventure talked about how he probably just did that as a mistake, but that his earlier brothers said, no, he knew what he was doing. He was just doing whatever he could right. in the moment. The idea of changing the church was just too dramatic. It actually reminded me earlier of the the brother who was working with the lepers. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of the documentary is when he says, I realized that I cannot do everything, so I will do everything I can. And it's just in those small moments mm -hmm. that we find holiness. No, absolutely, and, and I think that, you, I mean, I don't need to say it again, you're absolutely right. It's, it's in those individual small moments, recognizing the person in front of us, recognizing what it is the Lord wants me to do. Uh, I used to joke when, when doing youth conferences or something like that, and young speakers will say, go change the world. And I thought, my, I found myself thinking, it's like, who needs that pressure, right? I'm 17 <laughs> years old, and, and go change the world. I mean, they don't know when to change their t-shirt, right. right? So, for, yeah, I don't think Francis had this big vision, I'm going to change the world, rebuild the church. This is what the Lord was asking him to do today, and, and it's what he did. And, and that's all of our life, that... We ought not be overwhelmed by the call of the Lord in our life, but the Lord is going to meet us exactly where, where we are, inviting us to walk with Him further, um, and He's going to give us all the grace necessary to be able to do what, what we're asked to do. And I think that's one of the, you know, we talk about why is He so attractive, right? Mm -hmm. You can see episodes in the lives of other saints which seem completely, you know, unapproachable. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to write the Summa. Uh, I'm not going to go tell the Pope to go back to Rome, right? I'm not, you know, but just these simple things. I mean, there wasn't anything so dramatic that he did. He right. just did all these little things consistently, one built on another, and by doing so, mm -hmm. became the greatest, one of the greatest saints in human history. I'm fighting a contrarian impulse. Go for it. Let Let's me do give it. in. Yeah. Go for it. Because I think of what happened four years after Fourth Lateran Council in 1219 when he goes to the Sultan. Mm. You know, that's not just interreligious dialogue. That is radical evangelization. Yeah. You know, and that's not just putting another brick on the wall. I mean, that is risking your life. That is setting, you know, setting the bar as high as it goes. You know, and so later on when he hears that friars were in fact martyred and he knows that he has friar minors, true, in heaven. You know, to me, that is one of those things that just <gasps> takes my breath. Mm. You know, um, that is something that goes beyond telling the Pope to come leave Avignon, you know, right. uh, to go and to not just charm, but I mean to really present Jesus Christ and the need to repent and convert to the Sultan, knowing that you're likely to die, you yeah. know. 
So there are moments in his life that continue conversion, but also exemplify something that is right. profoundly but, but again, I think it, it speaks to his desire to be faithful to what the Lord asked him to do. Yeah. That, that that's what the Lord asked him to do. And Francis was pretty concrete and practical. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, we'll, we'll make this happen. And, yeah. and that's, we, we chose not to, again, we had only so much time I we know. could chose not to deal with this. Right. And, and everybody says, well, why didn't you do it this way? It's just like, mm -hmm. so maybe we'll have part two or something. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, actually, when I was, um, one thing that helped me a lot was the understanding of penance, uh, mm -hmm. obviously very, very central to his life. And um, it was explained in there that penance really means something closer to metanoia or, or conversion. Right. Um, in fact, I was reading something where it was pointing out that if Francis used the Vulgate, then in Mark 1.15, where it says repent, and it's actually the word penance. Metanoia. Yeah. Right, so, metanoia. Uh, but then it was able to, the DVD was able to flesh out that, you know, penance includes, what is it, love of God, love of neighbor, hate of sin, frequenting the sacraments and fruits of um, nice conversion. Job. Nice job. And I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but that, well, I, what immediately came to my mind was like something like mere Christianity, not not mere Christianity in the in C.S. Lewis sense of like what's common denominator, mm -hmm. but boiling it to the very essence yeah, of Christianity, and just living that. That's what he wanted to do. It seemed right, and this is really becoming a theme. I think flowing from the film, and it's what we hoped would be that that Bob, you mentioned that Francis. Um, well, you know what was his life of sin like before? We don't know exactly, but it was enough that he entered into the order of penitence, kind of like an RCA type program, but it was for people who were recognized as, as wandering away from the Lord, let's put it that way. And, and that's really where Francis's early relationships were, these other men and women that were part of the order of penitence. And it's actually on a personal level where my community comes from, is mm -hmm. that the name of my community is Franciscan Friars of the Third Order Regular of St. Francis of Penance, because he went back to these early relationships of brothers and sisters of penance. But Francis saw living penance, and in, in, you're right, is a, a journey. It wasn't, it's not a bad thing. We, we equate penance as, again, beginning and an end. We go to confession, we're giving a penance. Uh, we have a somewhat negative attitude towards penance. But Francis did not see that. The Holy Father says, preach penance. When he's given the charge, preach penance. Francis says, the Lord, the Lord gave me the gift of penance. And this is this, really what we're praying for and hoping is that maybe those who view the film can can adopt this idea of living a simple life of penance. It's going to look different for everybody, but loving God, loving each other, hatred of sin, the, you know, the, you mentioned those are all going to be a part of our spiritual life. Right? Mm -hmm. One of the persons you interviewed said that for Francis, penance was a matter of the heart, not acts. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's one of those things where it's not one or the other, it's both, okay. you know. But, you know, it goes beyond just performing the penance that you heard a few moments ago in the confessional. It really is a change of heart. It is metanoia, right. you know. And at the same time, that isn't as opposed to the acts. That's the source of whatever acts that seem so small and yet become so cumulative, you know, that if it is putting another brick on the Port San Kilo or if it is a stone, you know, or going to see the Sultan or just, you know, uh, accepting the leper, that sort of thing. Right. You know, it seems to me that once that heart has changed, then every single action is connected to that changed heart. I agree. I agree. And, and, the, and the other thing I think was to help me a lot to, in the DVD in regards to the uh, idea of penance was we can sometimes think of, of Francis being a little bit extreme, yeah, and like, whoa, Fair you know, that's, the going, that's yeah. one end of the spectrum. But, but what I think you were able to communicate was that the extremity is not actually in the self-abnegation, it's, it's in the love of Christ. He wanted to save up all his love for Christ, that he didn't really have any self-love left in him. Mm. And so it moved mm. from on the focus of, I'm gunning for penance. No, 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 this is just a means because I'm gunning for Christ. That's why I want to put all my love, and I'm only a finite creature, so if I want to have all my love to Christ, I, I haven't got anything left for myself. That's beautiful. That's yeah. a beautiful reflection. Yeah. I've, yeah, that's beautiful. And that really ties into, can, maybe you can talk a little bit about his experience with the stigmata that mm -hmm. occurred later in his life. Well, I think it's one of the, the, the most beautiful and poignant scenes in, in his life. He's in Laverna, which was maybe 50 miles from Assisi. And he's going there and he's praying, we're getting closer to the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross. And, and, and how old is he about now? Well, it was until 24, uh, to, uh, to do the math, 22, 23, okay. something like yep. that. 
Someone's right now, so I'm sure you're taking <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They're putting me on the spot. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he says he, he's praying that the Lord would reveal the nature and, and the profoundness of his love. And it's at that point that Francis is, receives the stigmata of Christ, the, the very wounds of Jesus. And, and I found myself, yeah, I found myself praying and reflecting on that, that when he says, show me the depths of your love, and what Francis encounters and receives is the stigmata. In, in this relationship with, with the suffering one, the suffering crucified one, ultimately is a revelation of the love of God. God proves his love for us. And, and Francis embraces that and, and encounters the Lord's love in the midst of that. And, and this, again, this conversion that each one of us is invited to, that our cross, our suffering, our difficulty, the possibility exists that we can find the love of God in that. Now, it's not to say that, that everybody does that, because we all probably know people who, through difficulties and struggles, have actually become more bitter or more cynical. But when we're able to respond to the grace and the love of the Lord, I think that it can actually draw, draw us into a deeper relationship. But again, I, that's one of the things I love about Francis, is the stigmata becomes the image of this. And the, the lived reality for Francis's life was the struggling with his brothers and struggling with the call that the Lord has given him, struggling in with ill health at the time and, and his body literally beginning to fall apart. The stigmata is the, it's the image, it's the icon of, of the difficulty of cross that every human person is going to experience in one way or another. You know, I can imagine a viewer or two watching EWTN who don't know what the stigmata are. <laughs> What would you, how would you explain? Well, yeah, just that, that he literally receives the wounds of Christ, you know, um, in his hands, in his side, in his feet, that they were visible. Francis, Continuously. Yeah. Francis tried to hide it in, in some of the friars, and not until his death were they aware of that, but right, bears the, the, the wounds of Christ. It's one of the images that has been of Francis is Francis is the mirror of Christ, and that's part of this, this analogy is that when you look at Christ and you see the wounds, you look at Francis and you see the wounds. You know, there's a book that chronicles other stigmatists, but it's striking that he's the first. Right. Yet we have no record, you know, and everybody knows Padre Pio. Sure. You know, 50 years from 1918 to 1968, but he described himself as a son of St. Francis. Absolutely. Capuchin, Absolutely. radically so. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, 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 there is something uh, subtle and profound, but also sensational, you know. Right. It's a sign not just of Christ's love for him privately, but it's a sign of I mean, Bonaventure takes St. Francis as an eschatological sign right. who breaks into history to show the gospel in a new way, to embody it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the incarnation, you know, that nobody had embodied it quite like Francis did. And, you know, his body showed the signs. Right. And it. doesn't that seem to be a contradiction, that, that the love of God revealed in the midst of, of suffering, in the midst of the cross is, yeah. is absolutely right. And just, to admit, just because I want to, because I love the, the image of, of the incarnation. I. One of the things I love about the film is that actually Father Cantalamesa speaks about the humility of God, and this really captures Francis's imagination. And you know, for Francis, the greatest feast is Christmas. It's just he, he can't imagine that God would take on flesh and that God would, would, would become human and celebrates this, this kenosis, this self-emptying uh, of God. And he would go on to say, again, reflecting on the humility of God, that this God who takes on flesh will now allow himself to be crucified. It was not you who took my life, but I gave it. Again, Francis is like, what, what kind of God would do this? And then finally, that the same God would humble himself and come to us in the Eucharist. And what appears to be bread is the living body and blood of Jesus. This, this just transforms Francis. So it goes back to your point, Bob, that it's not, for Francis, it's about letting go. It's about being empty. It's about being small. It's not, you know, I, like you said, I will never be the smartest person in the room ever unless I'm alone, maybe even not, you know? <laughs> but um, but that, that for Francis, uh, the, the other line I love, we are what we are before the Lord and nothing else. And Francis was able to embrace who I am in, in relationship with the Lord is who we are. And that's what this invitation of conversion is inviting us to, to be the person that the Lord's created us to be, not to try to put on air, not to try to be something other, but to be the person, and, and Francis embodies that. That incarnation of Christ that reveals the humility of God, you know, that's exactly the pivotal point for Saul of Tarsus, too. You know, 
in the Christ hymn of Philippians 2, I think we assume that he emptied himself so for 30 years he sort of concealed his identity, mm -hmm. you know, that he disguised his divinity. But for Paul, what he's describing in the Christ hymn, what, for Francis, what he's discovering, you know, in the leper and in the stigmata is not that God is concealing or that Christ was concealing his divinity. He's revealing divinity. Uh, it's, a, it's a disclosure that shows that the supremacy of God goes beyond his capacity to dominate finite creatures, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so the smallness of an infant in a manger or of a host on a patent, you know, to God, there's a sense in which, you know, being as big as the solar system or being as big as a subatomic particle, right. they're both tiny to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Right. And so there, there's a sense in which like, oh my, you are more immense than I realized and yet you can be small. Right, right, right. You know. And I think when uh, part of the, the genius and the beauty of Francis is that when he discovers this reality that the hidden one who is actually present in him, he's able to see that everywhere. So it's not, yeah, it, right, it, it's, right, right. that's I think one of the graces of Francis is that he begins to see the Lord, the world as graced. So some just kind of capture the, the idea of Francis in nature. Well, he really saw and understood that nature is a revelation of God, that, right. that in the beauty and the goodness of nature that God reveals himself. And I think Francis is able to see that everywhere. And that, that's a profound change in our, in our spiritual life, that when we're able to not just discover God here or there, but we see God's presence in his light and his illumination everywhere. That's right. hence that's the bird baths. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we well, bring okay, it, thanks a lot. We'll, we'll right bring it right back, back to the bird bath. You do, you accept your creatureliness <laughs> in a radical way. I like Our Lady. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we'll have some final thoughts on the wonderful life of St. Francis, so stay with us. I was very privileged to see Father Pavanka's new film, Francis of Assisi, Sign of Contradiction. What I really got out of the film was that Francis was a very human saint. He wasn't merely some sort of plastic demigod that no human could possibly aspire to be. He was someone that every Catholic can see themselves in, every Catholic can be inspired by. He shows us that every one of us can become a saint. One essence of Franciscan spirituality that I really draw towards is that poverty of the material world. It's a detachment from the material world so that we can lessen ourselves in the world and deepen ourselves in Christ. And that's something that I aspire to and want to join in the image of St. Francis. For 800 years, men and women have been attracted to the life of Francis, to the way he lived, a life of penance. But what was it that they found so attractive? His peace, the way he was merciful, the way he prayed, the way he loved, his humility, his simplicity, his poverty. Yes, all of that. But I think one of the most attractive things about Francis was his joy. That Francis had joy no matter what. He tells a story that, that if you go to a friary and the friars send you away and they don't let you in, that there's joy. That Francis, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, could be filled with joy. Why? Because God loved him. And that would never change no matter what happened, God loved him. That Jesus has rescued him and it doesn't matter what's taking place in the world, that will never change. And this filled Francis with joy. And I think for 800 years, people are able to look at Francis and they're able to see joy. Maybe they're able to see something even deeper than joy. That when we look at Francis, ultimately, we see Jesus. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. William, would you start us off with your thoughts? Sure, yeah, I mean, there's so much I could take from the DVD, but in particular, I'm thinking of uh, St. Francis as a kind of reformer, but in a certain sense, a kind of absent-minded reformer, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, you know, because he, he, uh, he, he has this, um, this word to rebuild the church, but he, re he rebuilds the church by allowing himself to be rebuilt, yeah? He reforms the church by allowing himself to be reformed. And um, we could argue about whether, you know, what he understood about that prophetic word. But um, I know Father Raniero takes it to, to, to the degree of like, he thinks he always thought of that literally. He never thought of that as a sort of, you know, task to rebuild the universal church because his humility 
couldn't allow that, mm. yeah? His poverty is so extreme that it's, he doesn't even want to own his good works or to own himself as a sort of prophetic, you know, a second Christ. And so we see from that that really the, the essence of the Reformation is, is his sanctity. And, you know, we are in this age where, you know, we, we talk about reform of the church and there's reform because you have office and power to do it and there's reform by criticism and obviously one of those is more valid than the other. But at the end of the day, they both have to give way to reform by sanctity. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only way it's going to happen, yeah? Uh, it's the return to the gospel. That's the beginning, as far as I understand, of the rule of the life of St. Francis. You know, you are called to return to the gospel, understood in this very mere Christianity way, the love of God, love of neighbor, hate of sin, frequent the sacraments that have been given for your sanctity, do good works. And, you know, whether we talk about it corporately or individually, for us to get out of the mess we are in, mm -hmm. there is nothing other than this return to the gospel. I think that's why I took from the Beautiful. Message. Thank you. That's what I mean. Amen. Scott? Well, when you look at that period of time, you know, the 1200s, um, Francis and Dominic, penance and preaching were the two things that were needed most, just as they are now. And there's no reason to to negate the sort of secular versions of St. Francis, who is the advocate of environmental or social reform, you know, but those pale in comparison to a man who allows himself to be rebuilt by Christ. And I think in that way, he also, for me, has become not only the model of conversion that's ongoing, but the kind of model for the new evangelization. Because if the new evangelization is re-evangelizing those who have been de-Christianized, you know, in effect, evangelizing the baptized, uh, it, it seems as though, as a cradle Catholic who was raised in a Catholic culture and a Catholic family and all of the rest, he does embody this kind of call that comes to us in the gospel at every stage of our life. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, well, conversion was radical when I was a teenager, it's less radical. No, it becomes more so. And so I, I just, I look at him now in a new way. And I must say, I didn't think of this before I saw the video, uh, yeah. the DVD. And so in that sense, he's a challenge to me, you know. I've been a Catholic now for 34 years or something, you know, but you know, I'm not a saint and I'm far from it. And so I have to love the poor one who made himself poor to make me rich and yeah. to others too, you know. And yeah. you know, in the process, I just think this is probably why the Holy Spirit causes the successor to Peter, to bring that name yeah. to himself, to bring this saint to a world that is in great need. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, so I, I reflect on the end of Francis's life. Uh, Francis has done all these wonderful things that we've just talked about. And he says, uh, I have to the brothers gathered around in the Portiuncula. Uh, he says, I've done what is mine to do. Now may Christ show you what is yours. And that's really, at the heart of it, I think what you were saying, Wayne, is that uh, we need saints, we need conversion, we need this transformation, and, and with all that's going on in the church today, what do we need? We need men and women who will do what Christ is asking them to do, you know, in, and being able to stop, be still, to be able to listen to that, to create it for the grace and the, and the courage to be able to do what the Lord asks us, and then to be able to step out in faith. People ask me, well, what is it? It's always the question, what is it about St. Francis? I think there's something in St. Francis that's different than the other saints that I, we, others can look at him and say, I might be able to do that. You know, that, that there was his <laughs> humility in his, not, not each aspect, but there's just something about that Francis that we see, maybe I could do that. You know, I'm, not, I'm never going to be the Aquinas, I'm never going to be. But maybe I could be small, maybe I could be little, maybe I could embrace, you know. So the Lord has given uh, us something to do, and the question is, is, is us being able to be quiet with the Lord and then be faithful to that as Francis was. But we could go on. Amen. <laughs> but we can't because we're we running can. out of time. But thank you so much, <laughs> Father Dave. And if you want to learn more about today's topic, uh, we have a handout. It's a study guide that goes along with the wonderful documentary uh, that was made, St. Francis of Assisi, Sign of Contradiction. This handout is yours for free by simply going online to faithandreason.com or by calling the number you'll see on the screen in just a moment. Um, I really encourage you all, as you've heard us being blessed by this documentary, to watch it. And, and a little bit of a trick that I only realized at the end of it is it's really not a documentary. 
to catechesis. Uh, you know, it could have gone along all the details, all the dates, all the things that happened and as Father Dave shared, there was a lot left out, you know, that wasn't a part of Francis's life. But particularly those last words as I sat there watching that movie, you know, this is what I've done, what are you going to do? It really is the question for all of us, uh, all of us who are trying to follow the Lord, particularly in difficult times, that the Lord would give us the hope that Francis had, the joy that Francis had, that he never considered this a burden, uh, but he found the love of his life and he devoted his life in giving himself to the Lord and to others and to us today as he still uh, stands uh, so powerfully as an example of holiness and humility and sanctity uh, that we could maybe do something uh, in the way that he did it. And here at Franciscan University, of course, we're named after St. Francis. Uh, that's part of the charism of what we do. Uh, we hope we give that gift to our students. And we're grateful for you watching the show. We hope that you can join us in our mission to educate and evangelize and send forth joyful disciples, just as St. Francis did, to restore all things in Christ. Uh, maybe you can enroll in one of our education programs or get a degree here on campus or online. Another way is through our life-changing summer conferences, with, which Scott is a part of and Father Dave's a part of and I'm a part of, and maybe someday we'll invite you, William, to, to be a part of it. Uh, we have them for adults, we have them for youth, offered in numerous locations across the United States and Canada, and we have pilgrimages. Come with us to Assisi at some point. See the very land that St. Francis walked uh, to in Italy or other pilgrimages to Poland, the Holy Land, lots of great destinations. So remember, please go to faithandreason.com for today's handout. You can also check out past episodes of us, as well as lots of different talks that will inspire your life. And as we come to a close, just want to ask uh, Father Dave, if you would please be so kind as to close in a blessing. Sure. I was just, just if I may, just yep. listening to all the different things that Francis University is, is involved in, uh, the Lord continues to rebuild the mm -hmm. church according to the mind and the vision of of the church and of Francis, and, and we all get to be a part of that, and that's just a great blessing. So let us pray. Most high and glorious God, that you would come and clear up the darkness of our heart, that you would give us a right faith and assured hope and a perfect charity. Lord, you would speak to each one of our hearts that we would know what it is that you're inviting us to. We would allow ourselves to be present before you, allowing you to see and transform, to change, to convert us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might be faithful as Francis was faithful. We might continually say yes to you as Francis said yes to you. And then our hearts and our minds would continually be turned towards you as Francis's mind was. We make this prayer in your name, Jesus, and ask your blessing to be upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 St. Francis of Assisi. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381, or call 740 283-6357.